So okay, folks, well, we can start. There is no spill today, oh. and that is because Clive unnerved me. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. With the, I don't, I cannot even pronounce the, uh, say, I should say, we're today, we are, we are assembling here to discuss, because we'll be placing this on YouTube, to discuss the novel Mephisto uh, by Kelsman, which was published in 1936, and the memoir Bendepunkt, published as Turning Point in 1952 in Germany and in 1942 in America. I should actually say that I own a first edition. Turning point, 1942. Wow. So very rare finds. So I let this go run. Don't practice mine. Okay. <laughs> Which was, uh, as you remember, uh, one of the great publishing companies in exile was Clerido. Emmanuel Clerido, a Sephardi Jew, came from in Amsterdam. Uh, he actually was deported to Auschwitz, died in Auschwitz. Uh, Clerido, uh, the uh, Klausmann's friend Lantoff, Fritz Lantoff, was the uh, writer, was the executive editor at Clerido. And he made it to New York and uh, founded uh, Behrman Fisher. Uh, we founded Behrman Fisher in, in New York and Behrman Fisher, so it's actually L.B. Fisher, L. Behrman Fisher in New York, and they put out a turning point in 1942. So I'm going to let this go run. Of course, it's actually a real treat to have this book in hand. So we're going to be discussing these two novels, Klaus Mann, as you now know, born in 1906. Uh, first child of Katya and Thomas Mann. There were uh, five other children, and things are very complex. So um, this is all I'm going to say, um, because I've been thinking about um, you. Maybe you would like to jump in, some uh, Clive, to report first, and then we can start a discussion. Or um, maybe if this was too hasty. Maybe I should just ask, uh, just um, to have an understanding of who read what and how are you prepared, and what would you like to discuss, and then uh, perhaps we can have this little exchange, and you can start us off, and then I can um, say why I got upset, or well, not really upset, but why, oh, why, you, why you made me think. Okay, so I'd just like to know um, how many of you are prepared to discuss Vendepunt? Okay, can I just sort of be, go all the way up? Okay, so most of you have read that, and how many of you have also uh, read Mephisto? Okay, a little bit more, okay. And can I just know in which order you read it? Did you read Mephisto first and Vanderpunk second, or how did it work for you? We read them 20 years ago, so, so I reread them. Vanderpunk first, and then Vanderpunk first. Vanderpunk first, and then, and then yeah. Mephisto. Okay, can I just have your assessment of what was it like to read Vanderpunk first and Mephisto, Mephisto after? And um, could you imagine doing it the other way around? Um, no. I, 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 I think <laughs> that's... <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's how I, I... Because you recognize the characters from yeah. the... Uh, from, okay. I couldn't remember that French guy's name, that oily little French guy. Oily French guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That doesn't help me to... But anyway, it wasn't that thing. Okay. Uh, um, right now. Okay, uh, because as you know, there was an enormous um, uproar in Germany when um, Mephisto was supposed to get republished uh, in the 1970s, actually not in the 1960s, 1964, and the publisher made an attempt. Uh, Gustav Gundgens, a great actor, uh, whom you know, of course, from the Mephisto uh, film, uh, had an, an adoptive son, and the son objected to the novel being published because it would, uh, uh, it would uh, hurt the rights of a person, a person uh, to privacy that a person has. Because obviously the argument that Klaus Mann makes is that this is a rights um, due to fascism. This is Gustav Bundchens is a um, well, I mean, an opportunist of the first order, and he made his career uh, at the expense of um, his humanitarian concerns, as so many people did. And of course, Klaus Mann had made very clear, also in Wendepunkt, uh, there's a large section about Mephisto, that this is not a, a, a Roman clé, this is not a Schlüssel Roman, uh, but that it is a character study, and that was a, that the Heinrich Höfgen is not Bundkens, but that he is a type. But when you read it, 
I think we all recognize um, that it is not so, and that in this case, uh, plasma is really getting even. And you recognize, obviously, I think if one reads um, Mephisto first, one has no idea who this Barbara is, and one has no idea who uh, Nicoletta von Niebuhr is. But when you read uh, Wendepunkt, you get all the keys handed to you right then and there, and you recognize Pamela Wedekind and Eric Kahn and Karl von Sternheim, which, by the way, gives me the idea of we're doing 1913 uh, in the fall. There is a fantastic trilogy, and we should really read this, just to sort of restore Karl Sternheim to his old glory um, of uh, the three plays that are very pretty that were published in 1913 up to 1919, and maybe we'll put Sternheim uh, just to sort of uh, restore him to uh, some sort of reputation, because of Glasman manages to demolish him quite a bit, so maybe I'll put him on the on, on, on the syllabus, and it would be very funny. Oh, I should yeah. also say yeah. about Klaus Steinheim. Book? Huh? We're going to find the book. Yeah, I, there is. There is. In 2012, the trilogy was translated into English, so it's up and coming again. <laughs> yes, maybe because of the 100th anniversary of Die Bose and the snob, and there's uh, there's another one, and he's very very funny, very very witty, and. To his greatness, another point of because we maybe we will sort of demolish Stanham a little bit here. And uh, the section is very funny, obviously, when he goes to Baden Baden, Stanham and Pamela having this Pamela having this dinner, and this is this general von Seid, and uh, obviously it's in praise of all the generals and it's um, and it's anti-Jewish. But I should say that when uh, Stanheim received the Fontana Prize, which I believe was in 1913, also he gave the prize money to Kafka. So, you know, there is there are many, many good points to be made about Stanham and I want you to read him next term um, and really as one of the great satirists um, of German wars. And this is not of course what he comes across in, in Thomas Mann's memoirs. Okay, so any other uh, macro comments before we start? What would you like to say right off the bat? Is there anything that you'd like to say? Two words I cannot say nothing of that double negative. You cannot say nothing. Against my, it is against my uh, reputation. But anyway, quickly, <laughs> I, I found it uh, really uh, a good book about history from his point of view and all yeah. the effects of mm -hmm. history in the same history from the left to the right, which happened uh, in Spain and then it happened in, in uh, Germany, in Berlin, in the streets. You're speaking about the turning point now? Yes. Okay, so turning point now as um, our bet, of course, it comes right after our discussion of Feuchtwanger, which was a, a history of Bavaria, you could say, and uh, chronicled the rise of Nazism. And now, uh, obviously, you know, there's some thinking going on in my mind why we're doing Pernod Point now. Now you have the same, for, and also with Mephisto, you have a portrait of Nazi Germany and pre Nazi Germany and the rise to power, not in the lower, not among the lower classes, and not in Bavaria, but among the elites, among the educated classes, among the intellectuals, uh, how everybody just you know, basically didn't take things seriously, uh, kowtow, was opportunistic, and let things slide. So it's a wonderful portrait to a turning point of the rise to power among the educated elites uh, in Berlin. So it's a counterpoint, obviously, to what we were learning with Feuchtwanger. So a bit to read it historically. Um, I think we'll have to discuss whether we can read this historically and what the point of it is. Just one, uh, one other bet? Yeah, two more, and then Mike will be your turn. Yes. Um, and you? I, I enjoyed, I just enjoyed reading the book, uh, uh, delving into the Man history, because this is really the family history of uh, all the domestic details that Tausman uh, describes in his Wendepunkt. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I thought his voice was very... Um, I, I could very empathize with him. I found him easy to follow and very understandable, and I really intensely regret it that he uh, took his own life. Well, that's funny. Okay, um, did you read it in German or in English? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, in German. So did you read the 1952 version? Uh, it's very hard. Okay, so there are, there are many different versions. Just let's talk a little bit about the history, which will be relevant probably to the point that you'll be making. 
So um, Klaus Mann wrote this book, and this is pertinent also to when we're talking about it as a history book, because we will have to think about why was he writing the book at the point that he was writing the book. So just for just briefly now, it was published in 1942. As, as you see, he started writing it. We know this from Wendepunkt in the summer of 1940. What was his situation at the time in the summer of 1940? I'm sorry? Paris has fallen. Paris has fallen, that's right. So in June of 1940, the Germans are in, in Paris, and it looks that, we're, that they are successful on the Eastern Front, and it looks as if they were successful on the Western Front, and of course Paris is of extraordinary significance uh, to Klaus Mann, and he knows that, there's an extra, that there is a very large uh, community of people in exile, and there's a lot of Jews, and he thinks now it's really all over. So that's the one. That's one situation. That's his, that's the historical situation. It's at the, for him historically, it's a point of utter despair. It is the nadir of his experience, and he thinks maybe next it will be England. So um, the, the 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 German flag is flying over Paris. That's one situation. What's the other situation that he articulates in the book itself? In the, in what's his existential situation? It's summer. It's hot. He's lonely, no one is there, and he's got nothing to do. He's just finished the book, he doesn't have another project, and he is, it's not just a historical situation that puts him at the bottom, but his family is in California, um, the other children are God knows where, all, all over the world. Uh, he has no one in New York, it is beastly hot, he has absolutely nothing to do, he's of course addicted to drugs as, as we know. But and from this book you couldn't tell. Ah, okay, good, okay, don't hold the, hold the horse, okay, because this is something that we'll be talking about. Okay, now let's just recreate where we are with Mann at this point. So he's at the bottom, and the, and, and, and the Germans are in Paris, and the Germans are winning everywhere, and the, the war is still expanding to the left and to the right, to the east and to the west, and to the north and to the south, okay? And he's got no one, and he's got nothing. Or does he really have nothing? He's got something. He's Klaus Mann. Wir sind wir. Okay, you remember this from one of the first chapters when he says we didn't like any of the other children. We always knew we were we, we, wir sind wir, wir wussten wer wir sind. Wir mochten die anderen Kinder nicht, we didn't like the other children because we know who we were. So he's got that. And it is at this point that he decides he's going to write an honest book, ha. Okay, so he's gonna write this book and it's going to be an account of his life. It, and the English edition of the, is called The First 35 Years in Something Something in the World. Um, the first in, uh, in the century. In the century, okay. Um, all right, so that's actually quite a claim. The first turning point is, is that the one? Yes. Uh, 35 years in this century. Wow, that's quite, that's quite a claim. So let's, before we go and look at um, is this history or is this true or what is it, what is the intention of the book? And that will help us um, deal with what you with, with what your objection is going to be, and I want to bring this in. I just wanted to figure out if you can imagine his situation. You have read the book, you know, you think it's a portrait of the family. Let's play with that, okay? I don't think so, okay? Because if you really, you, we, we, we've started, of course, looking at the early stories of Thomas Mann, okay? And we have done, and we ended the previous year with 1912 uh, with Tod in Venice. You remember Death in Venice. And we now read the stories up to death in Venice from 1899 to, to 1912, actually a little bit earlier. We started with the, with the earliest stories. So you remember um, Thomas Mann's sense of himself, his sensibility, his, the art of the, the blonde versus the dark, and the, and the sensibility of the artist, and being in love with the, with, with, with the young boys, and all of that. Okay? And you remember the, the bourgeois house. And if you're reading the first chapter in Turning Point, that's not Klaus Mann, that's not his voice, that's Thomas Mann's voice, yes? That's everything that you have heard, that you've learned from Thomas Mann before. He's a very exact reader of his father's work. Okay, now let's think about, let's think about the intention of writing the book, the book, because at least we must have a hypothesis or theory about it before we look at what he's not saying. 
There are many things, there are many things that he's saying and then what he's not saying. Anush and then, and then Yes. Well, one way of looking at it is to say that as the son of Thomas Mann, he is main concern, perhaps throughout most of his life, is to justify being a man. In other words, to show to himself, to the world, and to his father. And that's, I think, maybe the key, that he really deserves to be uh, the child, a progeny of the man family. And so here it is, what he claims to have accomplished. And yeah. that's quite interesting when you first see it. Mm -hmm. And what does he claim to have accomplished? I think, okay, so the bit that's on the table at this point is that this book, uh, Turning Point, is a justification uh, of Klaus Mann um, of his life. Uh, Apologia pro vita sua, uh, an apology of his life or a justification of his life and a clearing of his name, if you wish, or a bit, um, we are the Mann, fam the Mann family, I am a member of the young generation of the Mann family, and I am presenting to you now our life. What does that life represent? What is that life? Well, for one thing, it represents, uh, or let's say he aims, to be uh, an independent voice. An independent voice, okay. He's an independent voice and he can establish that claim and make that claim because he has lived it. The counter man to this would be Gustav Gundgens. So we have, on the one hand, there's Gundgens, who stayed in Germany and made his career. And on the other hand, there's the Mann family, not Jewish, who leaves Germany because Hitler stinks. That's a quote from the book. Hitler, Wo Hitler ist, stinkt es. Hitler ist gestank. And he doesn't want to live there. He makes it very clear. Yes, it is true that his grandfather, uh, Alfred Klingsheim, is, is Jewish, or maybe he's half Jewish. No, I think he's Jewish. He's, he's, he's full Jewish. Okay, so that makes him like a quarter Jew. Okay, under the Nazi, under the 1935 Nuremberg laws, you know, he could be tolerated, you know, and, you know it, but on the other hand, he was also a flaming homosexual, lived this life in Berlin, everybody knew about it, and he wrote about it, and it is clear in the works from the, 19, the 1920s. He never took that very seriously until 1933, because paragraph 175, which outlawed homosexual acts in Germany, wasn't really enforced, but he didn't take that too seriously. It was not until 1933 that he recognized that as a danger. But that is not why he left. He was not aware when he was leaving. He left because he didn't like the Nazi party. And that those are his credentials, that he left on his own accord because he was opposed to the regime and to, to the acts of the regime, even though even the anti-Semitism even the anti at, at, in the early years, even by 1933, didn't strike him as that dangerous. That's how unaware of the political situation he was. And it's really in 1933 and throughout the course of 1933 that it becomes crystallized for him that he must go. And he is upset at his father that his father is hesitating. The children say, do not come back. But he is pressured, Thomas Mann, to say something against the Nazi regime, and he doesn't want to do it because he is worried about his income, his tantiem from, 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 from Fisher. And it's not until 1936 that Thomas Mann, we talked about this when we were talking about Hesse, comes out against the Nazi regime. Okay, so all of this, so he has great credentials. He goes to Paris. Uh, he's active in the um, in emigre circles. He um, Founds this journal, this journal Die Sammlung, and in fact, I have the other journal. The journal he talks about Schwarzschild. Do you remember Leopold Schwarzschild, who later becomes um, more enamored of the right? And Leopold Schwarzschild gave, um, edited Das Neue Tagebuch, of which I have. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. Um, many volumes. Mm -hmm. So this, I'm gonna let this go around. Um, so this is actually um, from, I have some, some numbers from 1935 to about uh, 1938 or so, uh, a few, 1934 in fact, and Thomas Mann pub and, and Klaus Mann publishing that, so I'll just let this go around, just you know, see, see this, so another treasure, this is actually 
Um, I gave it to him, he thought it was completely useless, and gave it to me, and I remember that I had it, and now here comes it very handy. And in fact, um, one of those has an ad, has the advertising, remember there's an, uh, he, there is a large um, or a very big conference for writers um, in, in the summer of 1935 in Paris, where it's actually a communist kind of thing. And this is the here, Internationale Schriftsteller Congress, Paris, 21. to 25. Juni, in a mutuality. Uh, so it's an um, international uh, 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 convention for for writers, and it's in June 21 to June 25, and it's in it's in Paris, and everybody who was somehow on the left uh, participates in this, and of course Heinrich Mann is also there at the bottom. You will you will see it is Klausmann. Thank you for find for for finding that. Okay, so say, all of this. Heinrich, um, he he. It seems to me he takes after his uncle more than. Ah, he yes. admires, adores, yes. admires. Yes. He is very Irish. much a social yes. conscious. Yes, but he says about himself that he didn't, even though he admires his uncle Heinrich, he's always very close to him. Um, he was not a kind. He was part of the jeunesse dorée. Okay, let's and I will come to this because this is has, is pertinent to what 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 Clive is is burning to say. But I am not done with my, doing my argument, which <laughs> is we have to find out, and I really need to put this out first before we shoot it down. We need to articulate and need to come to an understanding what the purpose of this book is. So I much already told us um, or or put on the table. This is a apologia pro vita sua. Uh, this is an apology for the life of Ashtatico. This is We Are the Mann family, but it is more. Think about the arrival of Thomas Mann in 1938 on the docks of, of New York. What was the thing that he said? Wo ich bin is Deutschland. Where I am is Germany. Okay? And we understand, we know, Klaus Mann on the one hand was cl close to his father, wanted to be. But of course, the father, no recognition at all of Klaus Mann. We have to, we have to talk about this. What did Mann represent? Wo ich bin ist Deutschland. Das andere Deutschland. Yeah? Here, there was a point to be made. And if we have a royal family at all in Germany, the Mann family is our royalty. And it is our royalty, and this is a royal family, and this is why it gets the attention of all the people with people magazine mentalities. They want to take them apart. There's always something, it's always nice to find dirt on the royals. Okay, and we're going to go find plenty today. So, but this is our royalty because they represent what Deutschland, what Germany can be that is not destroyed by the Nazis. So what this book also represents is the possibility of German culture not tied to Germany. So yes, it's an extension. It is Apologia Pro Vita Sua, but on the other hand, it is also a bit to put on the table what it is like to be part of Germany's intellectual class that is not affected by Nazi Germany. Okay. And now we have this on the table, and now we will see how it ended. I don't know yet what's coming. So it's coming. It's coming. But, uh, what I wanted to just get in <laughs> is I think that Klaus Mann wrote this for his father, basically. Um, wrote it for his father. I disagree. I actually, I, but I want to, he has his father, is his, uh, his, his idea. Everywhere. I agree with that. And, and I, I also want to plead to cut him some slack. Because it's really difficult. You haven't even done anything. Was, no, I know, but but uh, I just want to put it out because I think uh, this is also what I took from this book. Is it is uh, a jeunesse de ré. There, they, it's a very privileged uh, traveling around the world and all this, but it is also a very uh, difficult spot for the sun to be. And I think uh, one one gets the feeling. Uh, he doesn't uh, mention this uh, explicitly, but his. His position is precarious, and I think you, you really take the sense away from this. Not only being That's exiled and true. exiled uh, German, but in many other regards, being exiled too, being uh, really out on a limb. We are going to look at this very carefully now. The, 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 the initial point that needs to be made is that this is a, if you want to put it this way, a PR book. It's a propaganda book. The book has an important function. It is written in America. It was written in English. It is written in English. It was published in English in 1942. The, the publication history is that 
Um, after the war, he wanted to publish it. Um, his father actually helped him. Uh, Monica translated uh, some of the chapters, six of the chapters, into German. It didn't really help very much. He really had to had to rework it. He, he expanded chapters nine. He added chapter ten and eleven. Uh, the original book enters ends with his um, entering the army. But now we have, of course, the service in the army and coming back to Germany. And the interview was Richard Strauss. It is fantastic. The interview with Richard Strauss is there. And now there was a refusal to publish it. And it was not until 1952, with the help of Thomas Mann, that this work got published. And it was immediately attacked. And there was a lot of birds slung, slung at him. So, but what this represents, if you're looking at the parts that were published in 1942, which is his entire life, up to his entry into the army, his willingness, this is a point made for Americans, his willingness to serve in the US Army and to go back to Germany with the US Army and to, you know, basically defeat uh, the person who took his country away from it. Would you like to sit down? Okay. Um, but, but his okay, so we are, we are there. So this is his bit. This is his bit. And now, yes, I, I, I agree. Klaus Mann's life is tragic for many reasons. And what you see is the polished shell, the reality of this life is very, very different. But it has a function, and he was very brave in putting it out in the way it was to make the argument, Germany is not just what you see in Nazi Germany now, in Hitler Germany now. This is written in 1940, as Stuart pointed out, with Hitler on top of the world. And to write this book as a counterfeit to what was going on in Germany, that is indeed, and I will agree with you, um, Elena, this is a, this is indeed a brave bit, and he put it out, ending it, was saying, and I'm going to want, I want to join. Of course, he was turned down many times. I want to join the U.S. Army. So that's what we have. That is the polished pearl, and now we can open this pearl. Okay, so we have it now. We know what the function of the book is. We can open it now. We can look at well. Where's the tragedy? What 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 was the life really like? And I really want to say that I'm a little bit afraid of this because I don't really like the people magazine mentality and I don't really like to look into people's private lives, but to some degree I think in term in, in, in Klaus Mann's case it is a necessary thing. Okay, so we have the bit and Clive it's all yours. So I I mean I, I, I didn't all I did was to find an article by Colin Teuber, who's an Irish writer who teaches at BU, and he was reviewing a book called Klaus and Erika, which is a few years old, and basically tells the stories of their peregrinations across the world and what a tight uh, relationship they had. And to me, it was a very lengthy review. And to me, it really brought into focus. And a lot of the pieces of the book that I was reading, which is it turns out to be different from the book that you read, because the 1942 English version doesn't have a lot of the stuff you've been is talking about. Is that all about. you had in 1942 yep. English yeah. version? Yeah. Also, yeah. you just had this, this book? Ah, okay, it now, okay, now, so, so, now, now, so, now just, it so, so, yes. what, what, okay. Uh, okay. no, it wasn't until I read the, the Toyman article that I, yeah. I, that it, I realized that he was, you know, 100% gay and 100% a heroin addict. What, what this book says, what this book, the version that we read is very different from what you, you've been talking about. He hides it very carefully, and when you say he wanted to prove to the American people that he could go into the army, he, he was a gay drug addict. No wonder, they weren't, no wonder they weren't eager to take him. So, but, and when I looked at it, I thought, great, this is an emancipation story, an emancipation of, of a great author's son trying to be a writer himself. And what's the first thing we see here is the dedication to my mother and to Erica. That's his autobiography. He doesn't mention his dad on his dedication page. So I thought, man, this is going to be interesting. But. I, to me, the whole thing is trying to emancipate himself from this colossal shadow. Un, un, unhappily, he does not succeed. He's always in his father's debt. He's always in his father's house. He can't exist without the subsidies that his parents give him. But the thing I was going to say is all of that is not clear from this version of the book. It came clear to me in reading this lengthy review of this book about him. And, for instance, you mentioned That's the his... You need, yeah. Well, you mentioned to me... Um, uh, is it Ivan or, or a Russian uh, uh, person that he was uh, involved with? Oh, uh, Yuri. Yuri, Yuri. Yuri. It's not in this book. Ah, uh, no, of course not. Yuri is not in this book. No. And so, and but on the other hand, what I is in this book? Well, that was not clear to me that you had that you had 1942. 
two on it. And what is in this book is the fact that he was engaged and the fact that he had this incredible piece of purple prose where he has something going on with that young girl in the castle. What was going on there? Did you all read that? You know, the, the, daughter, the daughter of the baron that he was staying with? The baron who was an alchemist? The baron and his wife who were coming... Hi there. Al Where's that? Al 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 yeah, yeah. Stephen Hyde worked There's an alchemical it is craziness. Like yes, it is in this one. No. Uh, it is. <laughs> I know it is because I read it and I thought, what is going on here? So I thought he was heterosexual and it was a surprise to me when I read this review that said he wasn't. And not only that, but he was a drug addict. And, and it seemed to me that the tension in this book was what's going on with him and his sister. Is there an incestuous undertone here? I mean, is that what you're talking about, People Magazine angle on, uh, on the great writers? Or yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of outing mm -hmm. about the an, an incest motif, da-da-da. Well, I mean, um, that was all in Thomas Mann earlier. That was in Thomas Mann earlier. But, but, Thomas Mann earlier. but yeah, that you, that okay, okay, okay let, me, um, let, me, let me backtrack. Uh, I, start, I, started to say, I started to say earlier that if you read in the beginning of this book, it, is, it feels very much like an account that Thomas Mann himself would have given about of who he is. Um, Klaus Mann was, as I said earlier, was a very close reader of his father's work. Uh, he was intensely aware of that his father was uh, ultimately gay, that he was actually he was actually bisexual. Um, and in fact, there's a diary entry, very interesting, in the 1920s, uh, when Klaus is uh, 14. When Thomas Mann becomes aware of his desire for his own son, he sees him lying. He's a beautiful. He, he's a beautiful boy, and he sees him lying just in his bathing trunk with his naked uh, upper body and it's all tanned. And he confesses to himself that he feels this intense desire. And the parents were very um, cool parents, like um, standoffish. They were not close to their children. Uh, there is a sentence in the, in the book. Isn't in this book either. They are, you have, okay, this book is a literary, let me, let me, let me, let me finish the first. It, this book is a literary book. Right. And everything, and in fact, gay writing at the time uh, was heavily coded. Uh, you have to read things as metaphors. Uh, okay, we can. Uh, let me. Let me. I'm actually not gonna. Not gonna. Pers not gonna pursue this track. We can. If you look at this book, even the 1940. I'm, so I'm, I'm. I'm. Dot. 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 I'm not finishing the thought. I will come back to the thought later because I, I realize in my mind that it gets to be too complicated. What I would like to say and, and, and start over again is when I said earlier, this is a pearl and it's a polished pearl. It is also a heavily coded book and if. If you have the key to the code, you can see from the start that he's not hiding his gay identity. His gay identity in Europe was on the table. When uh, Klaus Mann left school at the age of 17 and he went to Berlin, he lived an openly gay life. And that is what turned his father off. He, Klaus Mann knew his father was gay. Uh, he knew that he had desires, but he knew, also knew and was aware of that, and you can see this in the first chapter. In fact, um, right in the first chapter, he says that his father regarded marriage as a duty. Uh, on page 17, sein Entschluss, this is now in the German version, sein Entschluss, glücklich zu sein, was war dieser Schritt, wenn nicht, wenn nicht vom moralischen, ein vom moralischen Pflichtgefühl diktierter Schritt, ein Versuch, jene Sympathie mit dem Tode zu überwinden. He classifies his father's marriage in the first chapter as a, um, a step he has taken out of duty, Pflichtgefühl, uh, in order to get a grip on his desire for death. Uh, the Todeswunsch, the desire for death, the craving for death, was present, as we know from the stories of Thomas, the early Thomas Mann stories, and it was present also in Klaus Mann. He felt very close, psychologically very close to his dad. He knew that his dad was suppressing his homosexual leanings, but Klaus Mann decided, in part to provoke um, the society, in part because he was angered at his, at his father's bourgeois mentality, he lived it openly and freely in Berlin in the 1920s. All of his novels, including the one I just gave you, Highest Dance, Der Former Tanz, Der Former Tanz, which is published, if you look at, the, can you look at the, the, the book, I just, lent it to Philip, because he wanted to read all sorts of things. Um, 
which I think is a, is a bad novel, is the first openly gay novel in Germany. And he published and he, he published that. And it was known and it was known Erica was, was gay herself. So you have if you have the incest motif, okay, which is a real living of Welsum and Blut. We read Welsum and Blut here together. They were consciously, consciously, and this goes to what you were going to say, it was consciously stylizing himself and Erica to be the, 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 the set of twins in Welsum and Blut. How much sense does this make if both of them desire people of the same sex? It doesn't make any sense. But it makes literary sense because they want to be their father's offspring. They know how their father is wired and they are going to live it, but they're also going to live it openly. And there was no enforcement of paragraph 175. Um, everybody knew this. In the circles in which they were moving, homosexuality was accepted. It was what one did. It was épaté le bourgeois, okay? Hit the bourgeois person on the head, and this was what Berlin was all about. They couldn't have lived it in, in, in Munich with the rise of the Nazi parties, but they could, but they could live it in Berlin because it was big enough. Now, going to the coding, okay? Um, let me just put a, let me just refer to something that goes in, because Mephisto is similarly coded. Uh, you remember, perhaps, when Gustav Brunkens or Henry Köfgen for the first time pays a visit uh, to Professor Bruckner, who is, of course, Thomas Mann, right? And you have, in, in, and now we're also looking into issues of class, and I'm going to come back to how this book is coded, because you can see that the writers whom he mentions, and then Odenwald Schuler, and we're going to go back to the crazy baron and all yep. that. Okay, so um, I want to bring in issues of class, because I said earlier that for us the Mann family is royalty, and I really meant it like this. In America, and, for, and not only in America, and for all Marxists, okay, um, class is defined by the money you have. In, in Germany, and we know that you, you, you who have studied with me for the past 10 years know this, in Germany, um, it is not money that defines class, it is education. And, and education and the kind of German you speak, Hochdeutsch. Okay, you cannot speak any dialect. Uh, but of course, of course, Erika has mastered those. You, you have to imagine, those kids were born in Munich. They don't speak the local dialect. What does that mean? Okay, they are not part of the world, except Erika, who, who has managed to learn the dialect, but of course she also speaks, speaks Old Dutch. So we have these people who are upper class. They're not upper class because they're like Warren Buffett. They're upper class because they got the right German and they got the right books in their, um, in their, um, book, on their bookshelves. A second element, and now you've gone and you have to remember that we did the, the reception of Nietzsche when we were talking about, uh, about uh, Thomas Mann, and when we were talking about Thomas Venedig. Das Konzept des Vornehmen, das Vornehmen, okay, what is noble or what is elegant? Um, if you are upper class, you are Vornehmen in the way that Nietzsche defined it. What is Nietzsche's definition of das Vornehmen? What is it to be noble? What gives you class in addition to when you have the right books and speak about German? And we need that concept for, you know, to think the, the antithesis to this is Grünkens, or Henry Höfgen, I should say. It is that you have a grip on your desires. That you are not, or even when you live your desires, that you do not do it in public. That you are, that you go and have Pflichtgefühl, to marry someone, although Katja Mann was just as introverted and just as crazy, I mean, he found the right wife as, uh, as Adam Katja Pinkstein, as, um, as, as Thomas Mann, they were, I think they were perfectly matched. Okay, but to say, sein Entschluss glücklich zu sein, was war dieser, his decision to be happy, was war dieser Schritt, wenn nicht ein von, von, von uh, moralischen Pflichtgefühl diktierter Schritt? Ein vom moralischen Pflichtgefühl diktierter Schritt. A step that was dictated by his moral sense of duty. That was his definition of happiness. And that, in Nietzsche's definition, is to be vornehm. To be vornehm doesn't mean that you are a step above. It means that you are not lowering yourself to live out your desires in public. And that defines Hendrik Höfgen as lower class. Because he lives his desires with... Uh, Juliette and with all the and with the green boots and with the, with the whip and, and that de defines Pamela as lower as lower class. 
Okay, so you have, this may or may not be true, I am just now telling you, this was the <coughs> last month's definition of class. But now, he lived his desires in public. Okay, he lived his desires in public in a particular cultural niche where living out your desires had the function which was a pâté le bourgeois. Okay? This was in, at this time, we're talking in 1920, 1923 to 1929, the golden 20s, the war 20s, expressionism, when to be naked was to be, you know, to be um, oppositional. It was to be in opposition to everything that sucked, to everything that was Wilhelminian, oppressive, Victorian. It was the stuff that had to go. And in that sense, was he living out his homosexuality and was really living it out with total promiscuity and all of the Manchu, not all of the Manchu, go a little bit, uh, Erika, Erika did it and, and Klaus did it in that, in that sense. But to write about it, are you crazy? Of course not. Now let me go back, bring you back to, to this Hopner household, okay? Because it doesn't when you are forename and you are in this sense upper class or an aristocrat, this is really actually what the, the term that Nietzsche uses, an aristocrat, and have a mensch, okay? This is really, this is where the idea of the have, of the, the, the lord, of the, the übermensch, or the, the special person, the aristocrat, um, comes in. When you, are that, when you are such a person, it doesn't mean that you can't live your desires. Of course you can, but you don't talk about it. You do it in private. You read Socrates and you enact Socrates. That's okay because it is coupled with, with education. And this is this is coded. <clears throat> How so? What is in the garden? Okay, so he comes in. Okay, he sees he sees the beautiful books and he sees Hermes. basically Palais Springsteen. Hermes. And in the garden, and the, why would that be mentioned? Is a sculpture of Hermes. Okay, a Greek sculpture. Okay, a Greek Hermes. This is a reference to what sculpture that was on the desk of, and I should really have brought a picture of that. Okay, there is a sculpture in, um, in, a, in, a, in Palazzo Pitti, I believe, in, in Florence, and it's of a little boy. He sits down, it's called the Donaus here, and, the, the, and he's, um, I'm sorry, I have to sit down like this. I have wear good underwear, so I can't see anything. <laughs> and he sits like this. And he puts his leg up, and he bends down, and he put, pulls his, his, his sword out of his. Do you know the sculpture? Mm -hmm. And of course, he's naked. And you can see his private parts be beautifully right? in, in this particular picture. And that was the sculpture that was on the desk of Thomas Mann. So everybody knew that this man, this man was gay. And everybody knew that in this house, to be gay was completely OK. It was fine. But you didn't talk about it. I think, but I mean, I don't know what the mind of 42 was like, but I think anybody who was at all sophisticated with the list of people that Good. Was, now, you would have absolutely known. Now it comes, okay, so that, was just, and that is just like the most um, glaring example. Yeah. Now, if you read this book and you know who these people are, you, I mean, if we go to one of the chapters of the people he likes, so who are the people that he likes? When he talks about in the, uh, in the second chapter, this is Cocteau even. Cocteau in, in France, you mean? I'm sorry? Who does he like? He likes Jean Cocteau and uh, yeah. some of the French. <coughs> well, yeah, okay. And okay, Jean yeah. Cocteau, and then Brigitte, Hermann Bang. I mean, a Danish writer, one of the premier homosexual writers in, 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 in Europe, Hermann Bang. I mean, yeah, it is, there is not a one writer who is straight. Not a one. Step inside. Okay, maybe maybe this one, maybe Heine. Okay, Heine. Okay, so maybe Heine. Okay, so let's make Jews and straight, Jews and gay people. Okay, so I mean, there's not a one. I mean, you can't miss it. You just can't miss it. Okay, but it is a way of writing about it that is for the cognoscenti. Why write for People Magazine if you want to write? You want to write for your class. And that this is the kind of Germany, it is accepted. You can be whatever you want, but you can't be so. You need to respect other people's privacy, too. And it is what it, it means to have a grip on yourself. That's kind of where he's going and why it's coded that way. And yes, of course, now let's not forget and be really practical about this. Of course, you know, this is America. We're having issues now with just, you know, being regular gay, and, and I mean, now it's getting a little better, but even like 20 years ago, I mean, you all remember what it was like. And I don't dare, you know, with the talk that I'm talking now, I mean, obviously it would be mutual, but I don't know what 
this not happen to me, but, but you know, I wouldn't talk like this in Texas. So, you know, we, we, we have issues, and, and uh, in Germany, and it was, it was difficult, and with the rise of fascism, it was becoming very difficult. And in America, in 1940, it was extremely difficult. And of course, he was later also accused of being a communist, so, and he had tremendous difficulties with that. And Clive is absolutely right here. He wants to go to the army, and he's a fatal, so what are you going to do? Right? <laughs> so, it's, so it's a problem. We have problems with the army now. So it's, um, it's, it's difficult. In fact, we just have the first, was a baseball player just came out? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we, we, we're, not, we're not that great here. So, so to, to, going back to what Elena said, there is real courage, even in the code, even in the code of writing. Why did you get so angry at that? Uh, ah, because, I got, because, because when I, where, where's, where's that rag? That I don't <laughs> Okay, I, I, I know what that, I, I can tell you exactly what got me. I want to actually talk a little bit about this Hitler portrait that he, which is just wonderful when Hitler is eating, oh. eating strawberries, okay? Thomas and Katja Mann had six children. It was clear from, uh, as I'm reading home, Toyven, is that how you say it? Um, huh? Different pronunciation? Um, Colm, okay, so I, I don't, I don't he's, know he's how to call it. actually. He gave a talk recently at the U, but he... Yeah, he I know, on the he, Irish he, voices, yes, I wanted yes, to go I there, yes. I mean, he, he's a very impressive writer, right. he very is, impressive. He's, so he's, he, he's written this, this play about Mary, that, well, it's been sort of, actually, he's talking about that that night, that it's been, you know, sort of uh, misappropriated from what his self and his intentions were, but it's, it's very famous, it's from Broadway, not to be So, I mean, I don't really mean to knock him, and yeah. he is a wonderful writer, but he's, I, I he's can't, can't even work out much. What, what got me? Okay, so Thomas and Katja Mann had six children. It was clear from early on that Katja was most was uh, that Katja most loved the second child, Klaus, who was born in 1906, and Thomas loved Erica, the eldest born in 1905, and also Elizabeth born in 1918. The other three, uh, the very tolerated ones, were Bolo and so on, and then these and some of them goes on. Uh, some things ran in the family. Homosexuality, for instance. Thomas himself was gay most of the time, as his diaries make clear. So were three of his children, Erica, also most of the time. She made an exception for Bruno Valda, among others. Why throw that in here? She made an exception for Bruno Valda. How does he know? Was he there? Well, Bruno Valda's in the book. I don't yeah, think of that's course a, he's in the book, but because they're not with the children, for God's sakes. Not Bruno Valda himself. We'll, we'll give him a pass. We'll give him a pass on that. He was probably with, 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 with Gustav Mahler. So no? she was bisexual, too. Okay, so uh, okay, so Klaus and Bruno's suicide was in the family in the family too. Both of Thomas Mann's sisters committed suicide, as did his sons Klaus and Michael, as did the second wife of his brother Heinrich. Why throw in the second wife of the brother Heinrich who killed herself in California? How is that related to, 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 to Klaus Mann's suicide? Okay, when I read something like this, then suicide runs in the family too, and even Heinrich Mann's second wife who was deeply depressed because she felt déclassé and she had nobody to talk to in California. I mean, Makes no sense. And now comes another one. Work. Also, gerontophilia. Bruno Walter was almost as old as Erica's father. <laughs> <laughs> and in 1939, Elizabeth married a little very pretty to Seth Antonio Borghese, who was 36 years his senior. That's when I stopped. Okay? <laughs> That's the first paragraph of a 20 page review. <laughs> because, because I judge a book by its cover, and when the first paragraph doesn't do it to me, I mean, well, this, can only get worse. But 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 he has in his bag a wonderful dissertation I found online, and I will send you the, the, the reference point, the, ref, the, the, ref, the referral. You know, I actually even want to have her name um, published on, on on this little clip. A dissertation that was published in Vienna, and um, which was absolutely extraordinary. This is actually only one volume of the two. I printed it out by. Um, Birgit Fulten, Klaus Mann, Das Scheitern am missratenen Leben, Untersuchung zum Identitätskonstrukt Klaus Mann. And this was a dissertation that was done in Vienna in 2009. And it is absolutely extraordinary. What's it about? Um, it's about the identity construction of Klaus Mann and how being, how being um, his father's <coughs> son, uh, struggling with his gay identity and struggling with the shadow that his father threw over his entire life um, and influenced his, his sense of being. And it analyzes basically all, all of the writing and that was extraordinary. That was, that was done in a, in a very subtle way and I learned um, tremendous, a tremendous amount. Uh, Who wrote it? 
I'm sorry. What's her name? Last name? Uh, yeah. I, I, I get the Fulton. Fulton. Yeah, get Fulton. And if you just put the name in on, on uh, online in, in this Google search box, it will come up. And what is wonderful, you can print it out. They put the entire dissertation online, and it's absolutely extraordinary. Unfortunately, it's not Deutsch, and it's, uh, it's 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 tremendous. Uh, Philip. I was wondering if I, if I could just uh, get your thoughts about something that, that I was taken with in, in, yeah. in the poem. It, it's, it has to do with sexuality, but not so personal to oh, the right. uh, But he makes an observation about what it was like in the 20s after World War I. Yeah. And how there was a rejection among young people of the sort of intellectual, very cerebral society that had existed before World War One that didn't that that allowed World War One to happen. And uh -huh. so during the twenties there was much more of a focus on physicality. He, he talks about dancing, how important that was to everybody, and sex. Quite frankly. I mean it doesn't go into Okay, details. um it is I if if we have I barely recognize what you described, but I it, Maybe because I was reading it from a different perspective. You are talking about the rise of the youth culture. Yes. And the men at Bündel. Okay, so, and that has something to do with the perceived military macho maleness of World War I, which was a tremendous failure and which showed the limits of the kind of top down, paternalistic, authoritarian militarism. Uh, where people went like sheep to slaughter, where you had this top-down um, way. In fact, precisely where Klaus Mann wants to go, which is, I'm putting a little bracket here, uh, if you're looking at the last census, I think even, probably even in the 1942 note, Klaus Mann wants to belong to something. He just absolutely wants to belong because his major experience in life is that he's an outsider. And even though his... Um, gay identity and his living, living his sexuality made him part of a small circle in Berlin. He was to the entire society largely an outsider. He talks about this culture when he talks about the Odenwaldschule um, of ill fame and ill repute right now and of um, the, the Baron's Castle, Sch uh, Neuberg, it's on the river. Yeah, it's on the, on the Neckar River. And he goes to another school before, the Bergschule. So what he's talking about is that in response to this, um, and he, there's actually an essay that he wrote about homosexuality and fascism uh, in 1933, and he, ta and, he and he traces homosexuality, and he traces about why the fascists, why the, the Nazis are so much against uh, this form of, for, form of homosexuality. And, and Saad said he... He takes actually from uh, 1925 as a day, Thomas Mann wrote about marriage. And he said marriage has come to its end uh, because we now have other forms in which we can live our sexuality. And he also refers to the rise of the youth culture. So what is happening, and now I'm using Thomas Mann's analysis from this 1925 essay on marriage, um, which I learned about um, in this fantastic um, dissertation, uh, which is you have the rise of youth culture. The young wanted to be against the fathers who had caused the war. And young men were forming, uh, that, that connects to the romantic youth movement, were forming groups of men who were going out into nature and who were bonding. And Thomas Mann, very interestingly, brings in the concept of beauty. Those were people who admired the beauty of the body, in fact, exactly the way that Thomas Mann was admiring his son lying just with his bathing trunks in a, on a summer day on his bed, in the same way that he admired the beautiful Hermes sculpture or the Don of Sia, the, the boy picking the thorn out of, out of his foot. He, there is an, an, a way of admiring beautiful bodies and of desiring them without consummation. And he adds, and this is what's so perceptive about Thomas Mann in this essay, that when you admire beauty, beauty is not part of male identity. Beauty is a female attribute, and it corrodes the machismo in this culture. So when you admit, as a man, that you admire something beautiful, you become effeminate. It's actually interesting, I started Romeo and Juliet last night, and when Romeo is now married to Juliet, 
and T goes back and he goes to the Capulets, this is in X3, and T and T Vault challenges him to do a Romeo, what are you doing here? You're the enemy now. Go, I'm gonna draw and I'm gonna go, you know, I'm gonna go kill you now because we might have to do it because you are from the Montagues and the Emperor Capulets, da. And he knows that he's married to Juliet already, and he can't because he's a kinsman now, and says, but I can't do it. And this is perceived as being effeminate because he isn't going for the honor. So you have to think almost like Shakespeare in this in this way, <coughs> that when you're not going for the machismo, the honor, and the duel, you become effeminate. That is because for Romeo, so he's already married to Juliet. So what Thomas Mann perceives is that when you have the rise of the youth culture and the young people are together, and there's of course also the naked culture, you know, everybody goes out and has no clothes on and sort of like frolics on the beach. You still have this on the beautiful island of Sud, there's Nachtstrände, where people just go, there's a sort of like part of the beach, you just take your clothes off, and that's where you are, and when you go cross over the line, you put your clothes back on, that's it. So you have this idea, and then you have this erosion and that's, that is oppositional to the Wilhelminian culture. So he comes up, and this is what you perceive, that he is part of this youth movement that has its roots on romanticism, go back to nature, guys going out and fawn, and that will take off um, die Spitze, das spricht die Spitze auf dem Militarismus. So it takes off the, it's antithetical to the strong machismo that has caused World War I, and he very much emphasizes with this because he himself was not into sports. And I'm saying this because when you're now, and it's also quoted, of course this were largely gay, um, if Robert Blythe does something very similar here in America, or even when you go out, you know, you have Huck Finn and, 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 and Jim on the raft, I mean, there you know, go and bonding, I mean, there's two, there's two guys in nature, and they go off and they bond, okay, what else are they going to do? But, you know, okay, so, uh, let's be feel the love, but that's an American novel, so we have, we have a strain of homosexuality in American culture too. By the way, Klaus Mann loves Whitman. Yeah. Interesting, by the way, that he does not mention Melville, you know, Billy Budd or any of those, and maybe he didn't, he didn't know Melville. Uh, this continues, this thing, he develops this because he wants to talk about the schools in which he was raised. He refuses to go any longer to Wilhelm, Wilhelm Gymnasium in, in Munich, and in fact, and this is the way his parents always dealt with uh, educational issues, there was Tremendous freedom in the Mann house, but that was because Katya and Thomas really didn't care, but they didn't want to raise those kids. In fact, I think they didn't even want them. They were basically just raising themselves, and they had a slew of nannies, and you know, Thomas would always write from 9 to 12, and that's what he was doing. And, um, and Katya was completely uh, given, over, given over to Thomas, and adoring him, and whatever he was doing was, was the right thing. She was a little bit more attentive to the children, but ultimately the children raised themselves. There was just tremendous freedom. But, and this is at the very end um, of, um, that has my copy, so I, have one, I only have my notes. Uh, but at the very end of um, uh, Wendepunkt, he writes, um, freedom, Freiheit, that when you have too much freedom, and when you don't belong any, anywhere, this is on, the, and if you have the first 1952 edition on page 454, Freiheit kann zur Verzweiflung In the 1940s, his death wish becomes very intense, and his depression becomes very intense. This is in, in the new chapters, uh, chapter 9, 10, and 11. Um, and he says, this, in fact, the idea that he had so much freedom and that his father wasn't paying attention to him and that there wasn't any discipline in the house was, in fact, a very difficult legacy for him to deal with. And so this freedom leads to a kind of despair because he doesn't belong to anyone. And that's why this is significant that when we were talking about his existential situation in New York where he doesn't belong to anybody, he wants to make clear, and this is the point that you, that you make, he wants to make clear in writing this autobiography that he belongs to a family. To belong to the Mann family matters to him, not just because it's an aristocratic family in the sense, in the sense of education, but because it's family. Family in all his life, and in fact, to some degree, he didn't want to have a job. He wanted to be dependent on his money. He wanted his mother to send money. He wanted attention from his father, but there wasn't any attention from his father. His father was completely different to him, and that pained him his entire life. So below, going to the army, at the very end, he says, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have the, my book with me, because that look has it. He says, um, uh, just to belong to something. 
I just the idea that I can finally belong and not be an outsider, that was a relief to him. And that leads me back to what you said, the rise of the Männerbünde and the rise of a culture where young men could be together and it was okay to be together because it was perceived as also patriotic. There's a whole patriotic strand and in fact he describes that how when he was, I'm so not going to finish my sentence, that was something that was of tremendous relief to him and that's why he wanted to go to the internat, he wanted to go to the boarding school because he wanted to be with a group of people. Although when he was at the boarding school, he had a very hard time to fit in. And in fact, there were tremendous, uh, this, this group of people, Erika and, um, and Klaus were at a boarding school before they went to the Odenmann Schule, at the Bergheim Schule. They were so unruly they were so undisciplined that they broke up the school. The, um, the, the teachers could not deal with them. And so the upper forms or the upper grades uh, of the school had to be dependent. They actually, they actually ruined the school. The guy had to close the school. And in fact, there is a very near Lake Constance where, where I go every summer. There's a very famous, in fact, Golo went there. It's a very, very, very famous boarding school. And, and all the royalty goes there. Uh, Salem, Schloss Salem. Uh, Golo went to Salem. Golo was well behaved. He was accepted at Salem. So Thomas Mann, with all his prestige, okay, applied for Erica and Klaus to go to Salem. He was turned down. And there's a, it's a tremendous letter. This Virgi Fulton also dug up this letter. A letter of rejection from Salem to Thomas Mann why he can't take Klaus. And it says, that, and basically it says, this child has been ruined by reading. He is completely unruly. He is lazy. He is full of himself. He is arrogant. He thinks he's an aristocrat, and he know and he knows absolutely nothing. And he is close to outside influences. We are not taking him. <coughs> and now to his great and and, I, and it's it's a, it's a great letter. If you wish, I will I'm, I I will find it for you. It's a great letter, and it's a precise. These were great pedagogues, a precise characterization of who Klaus Mann was when he was 15 years old, years old, completely ruined by lack of educational oversight. And that is Thomas Mann's fault. Never had any interest in him. And that was the shadow. It's not the father's fame. It's the father's indifference and the father's disinterest uh, in Klaus that was, that was really ruined. Even though Klaus felt close to him because he recognized the same psychic disposition and the same, and the same sexual desires. Now, he was very lucky, Klaus, uh, that he was taken by Odenwaldschule. Now, of course, we know Odenwaldschule is a, a, a small um, boarding school in a very idyllic setting. It all looks like sort of like, like you know, hands on cradle kind of thing. And we now know, it just came out two years ago, that there was tremendous sexual abuse uh, by the teachers of the students. I mean, the school is basically now ruined. But as we know, and all of you who have read uh, Turnless, with us, we know that this was the culture of the boarding schools. I mean, this was um, homosexuality was, was going on. It was part of the U.S. culture. It was part of what man did. And Thomas and Klaus Mann felt very comfortable on this. And he had, and that was his great, great uh, luck, he had uh, one of the, um, actually the leader of the Odenwaldschule at this point was someone who had come out of the youth culture and the Männerbünde and was in fact a, a gifted uh, a, a gifted a gifted pedagogue and he allowed Klaus to not have to go to classes and he could pursue his reading and he had a tremendous influence on him and to some degree tamed him. But even then Klaus didn't really um, manage to be disciplined enough to stay there for a long time but at, at age 17 he quit and he never, he never continued his schooling. Erika, in, in, in contrast, actually did the abitur and um, finished her school and then went on to, to university, although no formal education. So these kids were completely unschooled, they were completely un, un, unruly, and they were lost souls, deeply and tragically lost souls. But Thomas Mann never had much of an education either. <coughs> he didn't have, he left school. That is a very, that is, that is a very good point. Yeah, well, he, he well, had well, tremendous he can't say he had no education. <laughs> They all they all were superbly educated because what they did they they, they read of course did, did they know mathematics and, and all of that I don't know but there's a certainly what what mattered in for the German aristocracy you know, did you know music and philosophy and and, and literature right. that's what mattered and then a couple of languages and you know they were tremendously gifted at languages in fact uh, when in in the diaries. 
when he talks about his homosexual encounters, and there were a great many, and in fact, this was usually, I mean, too many, when he was in France, many, uh, many, actually young boys that he was mostly interested in, and never saw a tremendous traffic uh, in, in that. When he describes his uh, rencontres with the, uh, with, with the boys, they're all in French, and the French is beautiful. So, it's, uh, so he was completely capable of writing in French. And within three years, he learned to write, to learn to write English, and English is, is, is gorgeous. So those were very, very, very gifted people. But the life is ultimately tragic because he never learned to belong to somewhere, and it's what he craved. He wanted recognition from his father, uh, he wanted to have friends, and yet when you read when you read uh, the marvelous sections, I, I think marvelous sections about describing the emigre milieu and all the writers that he meets. Okay, there is, I think, there's not a one writer he didn't meet who was living living in exile. And when he describes the French writers, you would think that he was having a very intense social life and that he was popular. Nobody cared about him. This is, it's all made up. Yes, of course he knew all these writers. And yes, of course they had a conversation. But André Gide never mentions him in his diaries. Cocteau mentions him in his diary in a, very, in, in a very dismissive way and said this is a completely lost soul and he is without any goals. I mean, Cocteau, for all his play, was very focused. The, the, the French are ambitious. Now, they, they might be oily, but they, they, they are ambitious. They know where they were going. Did you read? You didn't read it because you didn't get me on the first paragraph, but apparently oh, W.H. Oh, Auden said, when he heard that Klaus was writing an autobiography, he said, what is he going to call it? Subordinate Klaus? Yeah. Subordinate Klaus? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and Auden was married to Erica. How did that ever come about? As he, as he said, it's also in that article, what else are buggers for? That's what he said, what else are buggers for? That's very cool. Very funny. That's very funny. Well, can I say something also yeah. about another element of tragedy or loss, or certainly poignant, is that he clearly felt that he and his com uh, uh, intellectual companions didn't speak out enough, didn't support Weimar sufficiently, yeah. didn't yeah. support the yeah. Republic, That's very true. and allowed it to be chewed away by yeah. the, uh, you know, by yes, the... Yes, I think, I think there is even though it's not made very explicit, but I think it's very, it's really there, is a regret, a deep regret that he has that he wasn't politically oriented enough early on. That he just lived, lived a life and didn't really care, didn't really understand, and actually also wasn't taught to read the political situation. And he didn't, and I think there was a deep regret that he and his class of, of intellectuals did not support Weimar, didn't even understand the danger, didn't even see the danger until, 19, until 1933. And it is really um, you know, one of the encounters with, uh, with, with Hitler and experiencing the violence on the street uh, that made him see that this cannot be done. And this is where the, that, that, he, that he had to leave, and that turned him into, this is the turning point, that turned him into a political writer, which he ought to have been the whole time. And now I'm going to go to the ad that touch. <laughs> I also wanted to, uh, to say something about the descriptions of the exile life and the exile yeah. community, yeah. which is extremely fractured. And I thought, yes, uh, very fractured. Maybe uh, because he is sensitive <coughs> also to this perspective uh, from his own displacement. But uh, you, 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 get, you really got, got the sense that this day, so many different people who just washed up somewhere in exile who uh, tried to form community and couldn't. They, they were Jews yeah. that were picked out because they were Jews, but they actually felt like Germans. Yeah. Then they were, they were, there were all sorts of mixtures and they did not uh, adhere. They didn't, uh, they weren't sort of And it's not, and it's not just that. It is also, it's also this other element of when they were speaking, when they were speaking German in, in the restaurants. Dangerous. Yeah, it was, it was, they were taken, you know, for Nazis. And in fact, by the community whom they left, which they left at home, uh, they were accused, why are you, why, why are you leaving? Like uh, Suskind, who was a man, who, I don't know how was a Jewish name like this, he can say in Germany, he said, you know, I really don't understand why you're leaving. What, 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 what is your point? You know, you're, you're basically giving up Germany. I mean, that's very frivolous of you. So there was actually also a reproach, why would you, why would you be leaving the, why would you be leaving the country? Because this was not 
And this is astounding to know this was not a politicized community. We have re we've read so many of the political writers now, so we're sort of used to thinking of Cal even Cal Gauss, I mean, you know, who was white, white, one, you know, Canetti, whoever it was, was right, right on the point. Th these people in his circle, because of the play, maybe because of the homosexuality, maybe because of, of the theater, I mean, they were a very tight-knit group. They were not political. It, it, and when they were political, I said, well, this guy, you know, is just going to go away. Who can take this seriously? And we had to start, we encountered this thought in, in the first line of text. And when he hears, he actually hears, this is when he, when he um, um, talks about being fool. Uh, but René Clevel, uh, uh, Clevel, yeah. Uh, one of the people he, he was in love with wrote a, wrote a novel, Ed Wu Fu, are you, are, are you crazy? And one of the craziest is, is to hear Hitler ran and ran and raved in it on the Theresian piece and said, I mean, who can believe that this, that this is true? It's just, it's just insane. And what puts Hitler down for him, okay, and this goes back to the concept of class and why he felt that this guy wasn't really going where you, Shikaruba, you will never be king here. When he goes and sees him in the Café Carlton, okay? Uh, da saß er, umgeben von ein paar bevorzugten Spießgesellen und ließ sich sein Erdbeertörchen schmecken. Ich nahm am Nebentischplatz, kaum einen Meter entfernt. Er stand schmausend noch ein Erdbeertörchen mit Schlagarm. Die Kuchen waren gut im Kalten. Dann ein drittes. Und wenn, nicht schon das vierte, wenn es nicht schon das vierte war, Ich esse selbst recht gern süßes Zeug, aber der Anblick seiner halb infantilen, halb raubtierhaften Gefräßigkeit verschlug mir den Appetit. And so it goes. And then he says um, at the end that he, um, uh, here. Es war kein erfreuliches Gefühl, in der Nähe einer solchen Kreatur zu sitzen, und doch konnte ich mich nicht satt sehen an der widrigen Fresse. Besonders attraktiv hatte ich ihn zwar nie gefunden, denn weder in Bildern noch auf der illuminierten Tribüne, aber die Hässlichkeit, der ich mich nun gegenüber fand, übertraf doch alle meine Erwartungen. Die Vulgarität seiner Züge beruhigte mich, tat mir wohl. Ich sah ihm an und dachte, du wirst nicht siegen, schicke Gruber, und wenn du dir die Seele aus dem Fall holst. So what he's emphasizing, and for those unfortunately who don't speak, uh, speak, German, speak German, is the vulgarity. The uncontrolled appetite, and here it's not sexual appetite, although in, in Feuchtwanger we also have the sexual appetite of, um, of, of the, of the uh, people who are going over, over to fascism. It is the vulgarity of feeding, of feeding appetite. And then he says, and he says, uh, the, 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 the pure ugliness, the nose, the vulgarity, the, 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 the animal desires that are coming out in on, in uncontrolled behavior, that's what turns him off, and that's why he thinks he's lower class. The beauty aspect, that he's ugly, turns him off, and he says, you should go, are never going to be victorious. And that's the arrogance of the educated classes, who did not take this seriously, because they could not imagine, could not imagine, that the lower classes, and now I'm using this in the, in the Nietzschean sense, would muster the power to, to, to rise up and to win. And now comes another thing, I just want to add one more element because there's also the sexual element, it's not just the food. He's thinking about, as he's seeing Hitler, okay, in Café Carton, feeding, feeding on Advert Turchin. He says, this guy reminds me of somebody, and I can't think of who it is. And then it comes to him, and who it is? It is Hamann, warte, warte, nur ein Weichen, weil kommt Hamann auch zu dir und macht von seinem Hagelweichen Schafefleisch aus dir. Even I still remember from my childhood this city, warte, warte, nur ein Weichen, dann kommt Hamann auch zu dir. Just wait a little while, then Hamann will also come to you. Und macht mit seinem Hagelweichen Schafefleisch aus dir. And, and with this little, little hatchet makes you into ground meat for hamburgers. So there was this child murderer who was murdering all these kids and was cutting them up and eating them. And that's who he reminds him of. And then he says, all you will, this is so true. If we, you who have maybe just heard about the Warsaw okay, Ghetto, if you look at the murderous intent, okay, the, the murders that Nazi committed, the physicality of that, and he says at the very, at the very end, so was kommt nie zum Mach. Somebody like you will never come to power. Ich war meiner Sache ganz sicher. I was so sure of, of myself. Da ich mich nun zum Ausgang bewegte, when I, as I was going to the, to, to the exit. 
Du bist eine niederschicke Gruppe. Bei dir lag das höchstens zum Lustmord. You are a loser, schicke Gruppe. He calls Hitler, was is the, was the, by his real name. Washington. For you, it, you only have, you are only good enough to do a Lustmord. That's a, um, that's a, <coughs> a murder committed out of sexual desire. Lustmord, okay? And I think that, that to me is totally prescient. That he analyzed that the murderer's intent of the lower class and was not just to get at what the upper class had, that too. And now I want to connect that to when he's talking about uh, the palace, Ophai's palace, okay? Uh, when he talks about, he has a fantastic section, and we're going to close with that, he has a fantastic section about a description of Alfred Grinsheim's beautiful palais in Atzigstraße. And if you remember, uh, Richard, not Richard, Dreyfus, what was his first name? Lawrence Dreyfus' lecture on Wagner. He had a picture, an image of what it looked like in Alfred Grinsheim's palais with the Majolica and the Renaissance, Gobelins and, and all that. Absolutely gorgeous. And this is, you know, obviously where the man children and where we're seeing their grandparents. And he says about that, uh, he has this vision. And this is very early on, so on page 37. Es war ein grässlicher und dabei doch auch ein lustvoller Gedanke, dass man etwa durch einen bösen Zauber gezwungen sein könnte, die ganze Pracht des Ophai-Hauses zu zerstören. Was für ein infernalischer Spaß das wäre, auf den dicken Perserteppichen mit kotigen Stiefeln herumzutrampeln, die Gemälde von Lehmbach und Hans Thoma von den Wänden zu reißen. There was a horrifying and at the same time lustvoll, uh, full of uh, lust, I really want to use this, thought, lustful thought, that perhaps through a bad, to bad magic, one could be forced to destroy the Pracht, the majesty of this gorgeous palace. And then he said, and what, that would be an infernalische Spaß, a devilish pleasure. It would be a devilish pleasure to trample with um, uh, dirty boots on, the, on those Persian rugs and to rip the paintings from the wall. This is precisely what happened in 1933. The Nazis came in and destroyed this palace precisely the way it is described here. He couldn't know that. Okay. So what he and what he analyzes, and he can see this because of his gay sensibility, I think, because of his being attuned to desire, because he can read how people want to live their desire, but as they are prevented from doing it, inhibited from doing it by uh, by, by Wilhelminian culture, and he actually mentions Freud's Unbehagen in der Kultur, um, civilization and its discontent, which analyzes that you know if you don't live your desire, you're gonna get angry. You you're gonna get angry. You, you develop a a, a, um, a the desire to kill. He analyzes that in here, and what he finds out is that in these classes, the Grundgens and the other people that he finds, there is a desire to destroy the things that are beautiful because they cannot participate in them. And it's not jealousy, it's a sexual desire that is going to li get lived out in the desire to kill. That's a Freudian concept. Freud describes it in 1938, civilization and its discontent. And that's what's so good about, uh, about Klaus Mann. He understands the psychodynamics of the German society in the 1930s. <coughs> I mean, it's shocking. So that you can see that when he's, as he's describing Hitler eating this Erdbeerturchen, he can see in him, in him the lust to kill. And it is what he, in seeing the beautiful arrangement, the precision with which things cannot be touched um, in, in, in his grandfather's house, his fear of destroying anything, he sees the preciousness um, of this object organized them by this Wagner admirer, um, Alfred Brinkstein, uh, he can feel the rage cooking him that there is, and, and we know it's the imp of the perverse and Poe ultimately, and you, you're at the break and you want to jump because you can't do it, and you, you, you have this vision that you are going to destroy it, and there's a lust in that, and you imagine that you could just, ah, you know, 
get this mirror over there. And he, he thinks that there is um, this kind of di dynamism is cooking in Hitler, and that's what he does in this beautiful setting of the Erdbeer touching, and that's brilliant. In that, say, in that way, um, Klaus Mann was absolutely brilliant. And with this thought, giving him, because you wanted him to have something positive said, so calling him brilliant, we're going to close. So thank you very much. <laughs>